Chapter 14 The Dusk Norman Gosby sat on a bench in a corner of the Hyde Park, with his back to fenced area of grass, planted with bushed. It was dusk, about thirty minutes past six on an early March evening. The atmosphere was a mixture of failing daylight, pale moonlight and light from the street lamps a little distance away. On the bench, by his side sat an elderly gentleman. He had the expression of a defeated person who refused to admit his defeat. His clothes were neither expensive nor new. As he got up to go, Gosby imagined him to be a man in whom no one was particularly interested, either at home or outside. As his figure disappeared slowly into the shadow, his place on the bench was taken almost immediately by a young man, fairly well dressed but no more cheerful than the man who had sat there before, as if to emphasize the fact that he was deeply troubled and unhappy, the newcomer uttered a cause or two as he threw himself into the seat. You don't seem in a very good temper, said Gosby, judging that he was expected to show sympathy. The young man turned to him with a look of great frankness, which put Gosby instantly on his guard. You wouldn't be in a good temper if you were in the fix that I'm in, he said. I've done the silliest thing I've ever done in my life. Yes, said Gosby without much enthusiasm. I came up to London this afternoon, intending to stay at the Patagonian Hotel in Berkshire Square, continued the young man. When I got there I found that the hotel had been pulled down some weeks ago and a cinema theatre had been put in its place. The taxi driver recommended me to another hotel some way off and I went there. I just sent a letter to my people giving them the address. And then I went to buy some soap. I'd forgotten to pack and I hate using hotel soap. Then I strolled about a bit, had a drink at a bar and looked at the shops. And when I thought of turning my steps back to the hotel, I suddenly realized that I didn't remember its name or even the street it was in. Now that's a nice situation for a fellow to be in, who hasn't any friends or connections in London. I'm, without any money, came out with only a shilling on me, which went in buying the soap and the drink. So here I am, wandering about with two pence in my pocket and nowhere to go for the night. There was meaningful pause after the story had been told. I suppose you think I've made up an impossible cock and bull story for you, said the young man presently, in a hurt voice. Not at all impossible, said Gosby carefully, I remember doing exactly the same thing once in a foreign city, and on that occasion there were two of us. Luckily we remembered that the hotel was on a sort of canal. So when we came across the canal we were able to make our way back to the hotel. The youth brightened up a little on hearing this. In a foreign city I wouldn't mind so much, he said. One could go to one's consul and get the required help from him. Here in one's own land one is far more helpless if one gets into a fix like this. Unless I can find some decent chap to swallow my story and lend me some money. I seem likely to spend the night on the bank of the Thames. I'm glad, however, that you don't think the story totally improbable. He threw a great deal of warmth into the last remark, as if perhaps to indicate his hope that Gosby himself might be such a decent chap. Of course, said Gosby slowly, the weak point of your story is that you can't show me the soap. The young man sat forward hurriedly felt rapidly in the pockets of his overcoat, and then jumped to his feet. I must have lost it, he muttered angrily. To lose a hotel as well as a cake of soap on the same afternoon suggests willful carelessness, said Gosby, but the young man did not wait to hear the end of this remark. He hurried away down the path, his head held nigh, with an expression of well-practiced anger and pride. It was a pity, thought Gosby to himself, the bit about going out by once. Own soap was the one convincing part of the whole story, and yet it was just that. 
little detail that brought him to grief. If he had the brilliant forethought to provide himself with a newly bought cake of soap, he would have been a genius in his particular profession. With these thoughts, Gosby rose to go. As he did so, he gave a cry of surprise and anxiety. Lying on the ground by the side of the bench was a small packet. It had obviously fallen out of the young man's overcoat pocket when he threw himself down on the seat. In another moment, Gosby was rushing along the half-dark path anxiously, looking for a youthful figure in a light overcoat. He had nearly given up the search when he caught sight of the young man, standing uncertainly on the border of the road, evidently trying to decide which way to go. When Gosby called him, he turned sharply with an expression of challenge. The important witness to the truth of your story has now appeared, said Gosby, holding out the cake of soap. It must have slipped out of your overcoat pocket. When you sat down on the seat, I saw it on the ground after you left. You must excuse my earlier disbelief, but appearances were really rather against you. And now, if the loan of sovereign is any good to you, the young man replied by taking the coin hastily and pocketing it. Here is my card with my address, continued Gosby. You can return the money any day this week. And here is the soap. Don't lose it again. It's been a good friend to you. Lucky thing, you're finding it, said the youth. And then, as if finding it difficult to speak, he uttered a word or two of thanks and hurried away in the direction of Knightsbridge. Poor boy, he nearly broke down, said Gosby to himself, I am not surprised, it must have been such a great relief to him. It's lesson to me not to be too clever in judging people by circumstances. As Gosby walked back to his seat in the park, he saw an elderly gentleman, looking and feeling with his hands beneath the bench and all around it. Gosby recognized him as the man who had sat there before the young man. Have you lost anything, sir? He asked. Yes, sir, a cake of soap. 